Okay, so let me ask you a question. Uh, you know the tires that you saw, how can the tires be reused? Any idea? Any applications that come to your mind? Tires. Yeah? For train train wrecks. Okay. Train tracks. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, or maybe even roads. I've also heard about mixing for the asphalt. Anything else? Any other uses that you can see for the tire? Sometimes you also melt it, uh, heat it to release, uh, use the heating to generate electricity. That's a bit energy intensive. But, but in China, they used it for something very uh, different in addition to these things. Can you take a guess what it might be? For flood embankments, in the river floods, you can use these tires to, as an embankment. Okay? So we have to find a way to use these things again and again. You know, kind of use it for same family of products or maybe something different, but it has to be used, you know, salvaged for a longer time. Now, do you agree with me that, you know, the, 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 these slides and from what you have experienced, that we are doing things very differently? in the last maybe uh, decade or maybe last couple of years, there is an alternative view to doing things. Okay? I don't know how many of you agree with me that engineering the way it is done has to be done in a different way. Right? I for one believe that engineering is kind of currently quite conservative. Okay? They use a lot more materials. Maybe you can streamline it, make it better, better functionality, lesser materials. Okay? So... Uh, the advantage to that is if you, if you streamline a product, it consumes lesser energy, so lesser emissions, typically. Okay? There will always be exceptions to this, but you'll have to do research to figure out how you can get out of it. And uh, a streamlined product also consumes lesser resources. So everywhere you see like lesser resources, lesser emissions, lesser cost. And a lot of the endeavors that we are doing, activities that we are doing, have to, have to take sustainability into account and have to be probably remodeled the way we are doing things. So, now this leads me to the next session. This is totally independent of what we have talked about for sustainability. Okay, sustainability was a, sustainability is needed currently because we are having climate change, so everything has to be done differently. Frugal innovations is something that happened very independently in a different corner of the world. Okay, or a couple of countries got involved in it. And it is now turning out to be a very major concept and how you can do engineering. Okay, so this whole thing started. So here, this slide shows you about India's contribution. From uh, we were, you know, for a uh, we lost a couple of centuries in between, but this was one of the very super rich countries for uh, quite some time, and had major contributions to science, math, and astronomy. Uh, and then, you know, we had a series of whatever the history's guide you know, uh, lost a lot of things during that time. But this is also the country that first gave zero. Okay, the concept of zero was not there. The Greeks could not think about the zero. Okay, so India, Indians had been using it for quite some time. So zero was kind of given by India. India is also kind of credited, right, with uh, the spread of Indian numerals. Okay, if you, if you look at history, it first went to the Arabs and then kind of, you know, spread to the remaining part of the world what they call the Indo-Arabic system. The other interesting thing is the, the other part of the slide, which hopefully this animates. No, it doesn't. I thought, you know, my Mac will work really well, but I'm so sorry. I think, uh, yeah. Now let us try to... Okay. There's a very interesting table that compares, you know, the uh, gives a historical timeline. Okay. So we have on the left side the Harappan period. Okay. The weights and measures. These are all done. Weights and measures. The concept was developed, you know, maybe primitive form, but there was uh, a quantification of all these things. 
the vedic period has something called sulabha sutras if you have some time a lot of geometrical problems have been solved in that in fact there are also ways to compute a square root of 2 which was a problem for a long time okay and many of the other you know uh, jain buddhist the siddhanta period all of them were like known for some contribution to arithmetic geometry and the classical period of aryabhatta this is very important you have mathematicians like bhaskara brahmagupta mahavira and you know all of them have contributed immensely to the start of probably in a way you can say algebra and geometry and the last line that you see there between 1500 2000 to 1500 years ago right this is the medieval indian mathematics from the kerala of madhava the kerala is a state in india and they have a kerala group of mathematics and there is one person in particular called madhava he is supposed to his name is now taken with newton and leibniz for uh, from a calculus perspective he has done work on the you know the series for many of the functions that you we we now use very regularly for the sine uh, and also for pi by 4 Uh, some of these were also discovered independently by madhava in india okay and these all of these mathematicians were you know around the time together you have leibniz here newton and also madhava okay so uh, india has for a long time you know this thing of uh, abstract thinking especially from a mathematical point of view a theoretical thinking and people are also very resourceful i would say okay so and like i said we lost a lot of centuries in between due to invasions and colonization and what not but the resourcefulness is still kind of there and this leads to the next topic of what i call or what you know this community calls frugal innovations okay a uh, frugal innovation uh, do you know what the term frugal means to you in english any idea frugal is being frugal right we always say that am i right i don't know the equivalent german word for that but me which is a german word is it the equivalent okay which is what does it mean being happy with less thank you so much julian yeah i think or that but me or with what you have yes i do agree with julian i think uh constraints okay a frugal is having constraints on yourself or maybe lesser resources to go with frugal resources or anything frugal is like kind of scarce or less okay so it's very interesting what has happened that uh, in certain emerging markets like india and also to some extent china that the some places have a natural constraint on resources so this led to the people living there you know kind of actually innovating out of their problems into by making what are called frugal innovations so these are innovations okay there are typical characteristics for any frugal innovation very important to keep this in mind if you take any frugal innovation okay they have lesser resources okay so typically a simple design maybe low cost and uh, you can say reasonable functionality okay so low cost lesser resources and reasonable functionality so you you have these constraints now right you don't have any resources but you want to make something which will give me a decent functionality with what i want to do right and it will not consume much resources so that's how frugal innovations are born a typical example is shown here okay I think uh, which is a very frugal way of making cappuccino right so here a pressure cooker a rice pressure cooker is retrofitted is modified to make cappuccino okay so basically you use the cooker to generate the foam you know for the uh, what you want the foaming of the milk in a cappuccino so the product you get here will be like maybe 5 rupees per cappuccino as opposed to spending 500 rupees on a cappuccino okay the quality is not bad but the cost is less and this interesting what has been done 
the everything has been put together to make it work okay so the user or, or sorry not the user the maker he doesn't know how the pressure cooker works or what are the maybe the the dynamics of making a, a cappuccino but he just puts all these things together and voila it works and he says this is very economical for me it doesn't uh, consume much money resources are less and i can make a profit out of it it's not bad so he just makes this frugal innovation it is also make shift okay make shift you know what is the meaning of make shift make shift anybody the english word you just you just you just make it on the go right i mean you just put things together so you give me some things here i just put them together i don't know how they work but i just assemble them or build them in a way that it works okay i don't know the science behind it i don't know the engineering underlying it okay i just put it together so it works so this is a make shift frugal innovation so again frugal innovations are low cost consume lesser resources and they should give reasonable good functionality so based on this definition what i'm showing you here will qualify for a grassroots okay frugal innovation from here onwards i'll call a frugal innovation fi and this will be called gfi okay it's a grassroots because this is developed for people at the grassroots level or what maybe bottom of the pyramid but more importantly it is grassroots because it is makeshift there is no science involved in it there is no engineering okay so you have scarcer resources you don't have access to much of resources so with what you have you put things together and they work okay so this is the very basic form of a frugal innovation okay a grassroots frugal innovation so again a frugal innovation low cost lesser resources decent functionality and a grassroots version is one which is make shift you just put things together without any science or any engineering involved in it this is another version of uh, a grassroots frugal innovation it is called mitti cool okay uh, it is a refrigerator if i tell you only that much that it's a refrigerator what do you think about it what are you looking at it's a fridge it's a refrigerator it's a low cost fridge or refrigerator so based on the picture that i've shown you there what do you think is uh, how does it operate or what's it made of hopefully it's clear enough to yeah it looks very different yeah please no electricity and uh, ceramic for me no electricity and ceramic ceramic okay uh, you are close thank you yes there is no electricity she's right uh, ceramic yeah yeah right but any idea what kind of ceramic can it be can you think of something which uh, uh, some ceramic which which gives a cooling action i don't know because for a refrigerator right you need you need to take the heat off right so instead of a heat engine thermodynamic heat engine going in reverse right to kind of uh, get the action of a refrigerator but like she said there is no electricity involved here there is no motor there is none of that but it's a ceramic so what what is happening any idea a very simple idea okay it's quite a uh, simple it might not be obvious but if you can take a guess any ceramic that you think about which can give make things cool right anybody thank you that's a good one you know electricity and ceramic yeah yeah the material is some kind of ceramic so what kind of a ceramic would you go for if you don't have electricity but which will give you the cooling action is there something else required with it 
Pardon me? Terracotta, yeah, it is close to terracotta, earthenware. You're right, thank you. Uh, you heard about terracotta, right? Like you mentioned, earthenware. Yes, it is earthenware, which is a kind of ceramic, like she said. And of course, there is no electricity here. Uh, but there's something else missing here to get the cooling action from this terracotta. What is that? Some kind of evaporative action. Yes, so what would you need for evaporative action? Water. Yes, of course. So this has water. Okay, so I think somewhere on the top, somewhere on the top right here, you put water into it, okay, and by the evaporative action, it cools the entire structure. So you can keep your vegetables and other stuff into it, maybe for a short, you know, three to four hours, not bad. It will keep it fresh and it, it works very well for that segment of people who use it. Okay, it's called mitti cool because mitti in uh, the Indian language means mud. Okay, earthenware. And earthenware is very popular in India. We have sometimes tea in that or even cool water in that during summer times. Okay, and it, it's really very, it has a very nice taste to it too and it also cools the water very effectively. So this person, his name was Mansukhbhai Prajapati, I think from Gujarat, the state of Gujarat. He developed this refrigerator just to, he puts cooling water on the top and by the evaporative action of this ceramic, it cools, you know, the produce and everything kept inside. And you get a very good, you know, cooling action. Is this, what kind of a frugal innovation is this? It is frugal because it is low cost, lesser resources. You don't need an electric motor. I don't need any of that. All I need is a terracotta or a ceramic structure. Okay, so it's low cost. And mud is, terracotta is readily available. Again, low cost, not a problem. Simple design. So cost is constrained in many levels, and the resources are not a problem. With the constraint of cost, it is very easy to secure terracotta and make this fridge out of it. Water, of course, is a daily commodity, right? So what kind of an innovation is this? Low cost, low resources, agreed? And it gives decent functionality. What I'm asking you, is it grassroots? From what I've told you. You think it is grassroots or it is not grassroots? If, if no, then why do you think it is not grassroots? Some thought involved, okay. Nice. Any, yeah. Okay, so you mean to say some thought has gone into it, into making it, okay? Anybody else? They are saying that it is not grassroots because some thought has gone into it, all that, right? You need to have knowledge, all that. Uh, would the others also call it grassroots or not grassroots? Because this is very important. This leads to the next type of frugal innovation. First of all, do you think, how many agree that it's not grassroots? Okay. You can, you know, just put your hand, you know, no problem. I think a lot of you are not very, you have to be, either confidently say yes or no. Okay. Right? So majority agree that it is not grassroots. Can I say that? Because you think, although it is, it looks simple, it is still kind of, you feel it's intricate. You need to have the knowledge of evaporation, terracotta and all that. Am I right? Right? But let me tell you, that this is a grassroots innovation. Okay, grassroots frugal innovation, simply because you might be working in a certain area and you don't know the science, but you have a hang of everything around you, right? So for this person who was working with this piece of, you know, equipment, he knew that, you know, using the ceramic with water cools things down. He doesn't know the science behind it, but he knows that it, uh, this is the end result that I get out of it. He has just put it in a different form. Yeah, that is some kind of knowledge. I'm not saying that it is, it's not, it, it's, it's bad knowledge or good knowledge, okay? That knowledge is very handy, don't get me wrong. But I'm saying it is still not the science or the engineering that you need, right? The right engineering here would be, science knowledge would be the knowledge of evaporation, how water evaporates. So by knowing the mechanics of evaporation, I'll know how much water I need. Accordingly, I can design the tank for that. 
that might even decide, help me decide what kind of a ceramic to use. Even among terracotta, there might be different materials, right? I might go for the right one because based on this, I'll have a knowledge about the materials to be used. And then the structure, maybe there's a different structure to it. Maybe engineering doing some analysis using mechanics and evaporative action and including thermodynamics, I might get a, maybe a better design out of it. Okay, so there are many ways of looking at it. So it is not a knowledge that I'm looking at, a knowledge in terms of scientific principles and engineering. So this is inherent knowledge. Maybe knowledge more like, you know, the person, it, it, it's a trade craft. Somebody working in that area knows that it does these things, how can I put it to good use? Okay, so that's why I also call this a grassroots frugal innovation. Again, lesser resources, low cost, decent functionality, but there is no science or engineering involved in it. It is completely makeshift. Okay, so this is Mitti Cool, but this thing became so popular in India and uh, at least for a chunk of population that uses it, okay, it was also exported to other countries. Now there are engineering institutes in India helping them out. There are people with the relevant scientific and engineering background who, who are helping this entrepreneur out to make it better. He's got better products now coming from his, you know, uh, a startup. It is not a startup anymore. I think it's doing quite well. Now it is qualifying to be the next level of a frugal innovation because science is involved in it. So when you involve science in making any frugal innovation, okay, we get, okay, what I call, uh, I'll erase this side. Okay, we know what are frugal innovations. We get an advanced frugal innovation. Okay? Or AFI. Okay? And AFI is again low cost. Okay, it uses lesser resources. Okay, but excellent functionality. Now I'm using the word excellent. Why is that so? Why am I saying excellent functionality? Because I'm involving science and engineering. This is not makeshift. Okay, and this uses science uh, or applied science which is engineering or any knowledge base that is needed to make this possible huh? or any knowledge base needed okay so can you read my writing not a it's clear right okay so any knowledge base needed for it now by the way uh, this can also involve cutting edge research. Okay, we'll get to that soon. It can also involve cutting edge research. We don't know. Okay, so an advanced frugal innovation is low cost, lesser resources. Uh, these two are common with any frugal innovation, but it's excellent functionality. Okay, functionality is not reasonable now, it's excellent. Why is that so? Why is functionality excellent? Why am I saying that? Because I am using science and engineering, exactly, because I know how this thing works. So I can actually design it in such a way that I get something better, okay, and improve its functionality. Anything else about it? Anything else about it? About an advanced frugal innovation. The grassroots frugal innovation, where are they applied? Typically in settings where there is a natural scarcity in resources, right? where I don't have access to resources, whatever the reason. So I innovate out of it through grassroots innovations. For an advanced frugal innovation, that is not the case. I have ample resources, but I put artificial constraints on myself. Okay, that look, I will consume only this much, right? And that is how these innovations, which came from the humble frugal ones, are applicable to the wider world. Rich, developing nations, all of them, all of them. Okay, so now I'm going to show you many examples of advanced frugal innovation. This is the last, uh, the Mitti Cool is the last grassroots innovation I've showed you. Every other innovation in these slides are now an advanced frugal innovation. 
science and engineering has gone into making it possible. Okay? And they go in increasing levels of sophistication or engineering knowledge or scientific knowledge. Okay? We'll look at it. There are many examples, but I've just put some here for this class. Many of you might know this, the bamboo uh, the bicycle. How many of you have ridden one? Have you ever uh, tried a bamboo bicycle? No? Okay. This is a very interesting engineering project. Okay? I don't know. I know that uh, uh, one of the groups here in engineering and product design, they actually have this bamboo bike made. Okay? In my department, there is a colleague who made this. And uh, uh, it uses bamboo. Uh, what kind of a family is bamboo? Is it a grass family or a... Any idea? It's a, it's a grass family. So it grows by about two to three meters a day. So very cheap. But if I tell you that bamboo has got better properties than steel, or it's comparable to steel in terms of mechanical properties, can you believe me? You, you will have a tough time believing me. But if you treat the bamboo, okay, you give some simple heat treatment, and it becomes as strong okay, or comparable to aluminum and steel. Okay? So as a construction material, that's the beauty of it. And this is used to make the frame of a cycle, okay? important parts of a cycle, what you see here. And the ride quality is better than what you would do on a normal cycle, from what I've heard. I've not driven one myself, but I've been told by my colleagues that the ride quality is very good. Now, to make this thing, you need very precise knowledge of the heat treatment to be used, the structure of bamboo to put it to good use, and you knew, need to know the structural mechanics of this thing to make it a success. That is what has gone into it. Uh, on the internet, you will have many you know, recipes to make this, many ways of making a bamboo bicycle, but please remember there is strong engineering and science underlying that. That is how that recipe has been given to you. Okay? So first example is a bamboo bicycle. And <clears throat> this was a very interesting case study done by KPMG, the consulting house, along with a person called Jeffrey Sachs, Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University. So they started this project in, uh, in Ghana, Africa, and uh, they created a little ecosystem based on bamboo bikes. There was a factory making bamboo bikes, okay, and that people were employed to make them, and also that was given to people around for their functionality, for recreation, and all that. So an entire ecosystem running on bamboo bikes. Okay, very interesting experiment. But bamboo bikes are a, a, a very nice uh, uh, a device contraption. Okay, the first advanced physical innovation. This is very interesting. It's a bamboo microscope. Okay, it's a bamboo microscope, again made from bamboo, and this was made by a company in India called Jadu Gyan. I've, I've been trying to ping them, but I don't know, they, don't know whether they exist anymore or whether they've changed their name. But this is a microscope they came up with. It has got only one magnification. Okay? Very limited functionality, but this has been designed using the principles of optical microscopy. And this was started as a low-cost microscope for teaching elementary students. Later, it got used for some research in biology, okay? And the papers were published using the bamboo microscope as a device, okay, for carrying out experiments. This was reported in Nature sometime in 2007. Very interesting, okay? Every innovation here is a little more sophisticated than the previous one. That is how I'm going. This is something that we have been trying to develop in my group. So we have uh, proved the concept. So we are using actually the pedaling action of a bike to filter water. Okay? So no motor required, nothing of that sort. So the entire filtration is designed with pedaling in mind. We have patented this technology. So you just put water at one end, you start pedaling, and it gives out filtered water, potable water. Okay? It has many applications. We are now trying to kind of uh, make a commercial version out of it. So that has been taking some time because I work with undergraduate students, and that is always a flowing you know, a group. So hopefully soon we'll get this thing completed. I was very fortunate to have one of the uh, undergraduate bachelor students working with me who developed this concept along with me. Okay, he's currently done his PhD. He's doing well, and uh, he did a very good job in uh, designing and developing this thing out. This is very interesting. A frugal washing machine. Okay, how do you think this is operated? Is it Yes, okay, there is no, there is no uh, uh, you know, motor here. It is hand-cranked, okay? Very interesting. 
Now, uh, you, you see these, I don't know if it's visible, but all of these channels here are like hexagonal in cross-section. And these channels have been designed by doing computational fluid dynamic simulations. Okay? So they wanted to have the right flow of the liquid along with the detergent to get the best action for cleaning your clothes. And it takes about five to 10 minutes of cranking and the output is supposed to be better than even you know, conventional washing machines. And this was done by a bunch of mechanical engineers. And they've started a company you know, for this uh, hand-cranked washing machine. It's called Gentle Washer. Okay, so this was reported by ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Very interesting, you know, hand-cranked, but a lot of CFD analysis has gone into making this possible. Again, an advanced frugal innovation, very less resources, okay? You don't have electricity and all that. Simple, but the design is quite complicated, okay? To, the trick is to get this right, the, the channels that you see there, okay? A lot of science and engineering has gone into it to make this possible, and it is low cost. I think I'll stop here now before lunch, okay? It's 12. We'll meet again at 1 in this room after lunch, okay? Julian, you just check this. Just pressed it, start and Perfect. good, no? Perfect, okay, nice. So, uh, we just talked about the washing machine, right? The frugal washing machine, gentle washer. And what made it uh, an advanced was the, the channels that you see here, right? Uh, these are designed by computational fluid dynamics to get the right mixing of water, the right turbulence, if I can use that term, the right flow with the detergent, so you get good performance out of hand cranking, okay? Very interesting. Again, this is an advanced frugal innovation. I'm not going to keep telling this now, AFI. All, all the innovations I'm going to show you are advanced frugal innovations from here onwards. They are low cost, lower resources, okay? And science and engineering going into it to make it possible. And many times, because we say lower resources, the design turns out to be simple. Okay, fewer components, design turns out to be simple. But frugal does not mean cheap. Frugal is not cheap. Frugal, you know, behind that simple thing is a very complex, probably, mechanism. And many times you have to use cutting edge research to design an advanced frugal innovation. Okay, so we'll see some examples from here onwards. Now, this is an example of research, what you see here. Okay, this is not a class project. This is actually a dedicated, you know, uh, research work to make this possible. Uh, the Nano, I don't know how many of you know this, from India, so Tata's, right, the Tata Sons, it's an Indian conglomerate. In fact, they are the ones who now own Jaguar Land Rover, okay, so uh, they are majorly into automotive uh, engineering. They make a lot of automotive vehicles for the Indian market. And this is something that they thought about and also introduced, right, a very cheap, low-cost car for the Indian market and maybe elsewhere. So it has the minimum functionality, okay, and it's loaded with decent goodies and uh, a very nice concept, if you will ask me. And making something like this is, is, is not grassroots, right? You cannot make things together and make it work like a car. You need to know the engineering behind it, very important. And especially when you're making it low cost, out of lesser resources, right? You need to use more of engineering to see what else you can get out of it, how much maximum you can get out of it. So, uh, this, I, I don't think they are, the, the production is not that high for the nano now, but it started as a very good concept. But I don't know who started this concept with the Tatas for the first ones, but there are many other companies that are doing something similar. Like Nissan, the Japanese company has a car called Leaf, right? And Mercedes itself has a concept called Smart, right? But Mercedes has been doing this for quite some time now, even before I think the Tatas came up with uh, nano. So this concept has actually caught on. You know, smaller vehicles, which not only go on highways, but they can also go into narrower streets. So this is like, increases your mobility a lot. So here is something which is low cost, lesser resources, good science and engineering, has, go, has got more applications. And uh, you, have to, you have to know that when you make a, 
uh, an advanced frugal product because your constraints are limited, sorry, because your resources are limited, there might be some room for failure. Okay, so you have to consider all the scenarios of failure possible. Even then, engineering is such that you cannot avoid every uncertainty, but you have to keep an eye on that. So the first two versions of a product may have problems, but once you take care of all the products, it's a nice product or service to give. Okay, nice product or service to give. So the next advanced frugal, it's not a product, it's a service. Okay, so India is also known for medical tourism. A lot of people come from all over the world to India for uh, getting, you know, surgery and many other medical services at low cost. But you get very good service in return. Many of the Indian doctors are very talented, okay? And uh, in my country, it is very difficult to get into medicine or uh, good colleges for engineering. So these attract, uh, you know, the very top talent. And also because there are so many cases in India, these people also are well trained in taking care of many of the maladies. So this is a hospital called uh, Narayana Ridayalaya. It's based in Bengaluru or Bangalore. And it's, it's very interesting. What they have done is they have, they have gotten the technique of mass production to uh, hospitals, okay, to surgery. Any idea who introduced uh, mass production in factories? Can somebody tell me? So sorry, this is... Uh, Mass production, right? Who uh, who pioneered it? Right? Anybody? I can tell you that a car was uh, the internal combustion engine was discovered in Germany, right? So yeah. Henry Ford. Yeah, you're right. Henry Ford is the one who pioneered the uh, the mass production technique, right? Everybody doing something little. Okay, along a transfer line. So he or she is very good in what they do at that one station. So you keep on adding your expertise and you make a complete product. So with the result, you save on the cost a lot. But you get a good product in the end. And Henry Ford used this to build something called the Model T, okay, which was a very classic, uh, very well-known uh, automotive vehicle of its time in the US. And this led to the creation of roads and a lot of other things, you know, like the supply chain for that, you know, the infrastructure to accommodate that. So this had a lot of spillover effects. So the mass production introduced by Henry Ford has been introduced into surgery. And here, all the doctors are known for some parts, right, of the surgery, and they do it very well. So when a patient arrives, now a patient is like a product, okay? They work on them, okay, all the doctors individually. And because they're, he or she, they're very good in what they do, in a, in a decent amount of time, they get the surgery done and the cost is reduced. So at Narayana Ridayalaya, they do many of the very complex uh, uh, cardio surgeries, heart surgeries, okay, at, at maybe a fraction of a cost. So this is, again, you know, low cost. The resources are good, quality is very good. And uh, here, obviously, you need to know the science or you need to have the medical training, right? Otherwise, you cannot do this, okay? So this is one example I'm showing of a service, not a product. <clears throat> this is very interesting. Uh, General Electric. General Electric is very much into advanced frugal innovations from a healthcare point of view. So it all started with their uh, case study in China. Uh, there is something called ultrasound that you used for many diagnostics in uh, medicine, okay? There are many applications for it. I think as shown here, it's there for cardiology, monitoring fetal health, you know, uh, a lot of other, you know, uh, diagnosis where you need an ultrasound, wherein basically you, uh, you shine a source of ultrasound and the time it takes for the ultrasound wave to go and get reflected back, you use that to kind of reconstruct, right? Or get a signal out for uh, diagnostics. Uh, in China, there was, as anywhere else in the world, there was a big demand for it. But what G engineers, engineers of General Electric, figured out was that people in rural China were not using these tests a lot. And they later figured out the, the problem was that many of them had to travel a lot to come to a center to get diagnosed with one of their, you know, traditional equipment. And these equipment were typically made in Japan and US. They were very big equipment. The equipment themselves were costing around, I think, uh, how much? About maybe 
$300,000 and above, okay, for a conventional ultrasound equipment. So obviously, the hospital has to get the, recover the cost from the customers, right? So customers found it a bit expensive. And number two, they had to travel. There were more expenses involved in that. So the engineers at GE, they thought that, you know, why not get something to the people in villages and rural area, okay? The same ultrasound. So they just, you know, they had a very novel approach. They said, we don't want to talk about the big equipment. All they did was they discovered a new probe, an ultrasound probe, and they had all the sophistication of the equipment went into a software on a laptop, on a cheap laptop. Okay, so you have a laptop and a probe, that's it. You just go to the patient concern, get the signal, the laptop will, you know, run the, take the inputs, and their main program was in a cloud. So you talk to the cloud, get the diagnosis done, and voila, you know, you have your results ready. In fact, the results were so good that some of the, uh, the, uh, the efficacy, right, the efficiency of the method was better than the conventional big equipment, clunky equipment one. So what happened was, other than China, it was a success in China, and now the same technology gets exported to US, and maybe I think it's also used maybe in Europe. So people in the US figured out that we have use for such portable ultrasound for emergency situations, trauma situations, and also in cases where we have to carry this thing and help a patient. And in fact, the quality was so good that it, has be, it is being used in more number of places in the US and other you know, uh, rich countries. So here is something which developed in a so-called emerging market and expanded everywhere, okay? So the advanced frugal product is a portable version of an ultrasound, okay, a medical ultrasound. And uh, so typical customers, and then it says 2002, a local team in China leveraged G's global resources to develop a cheap portable machine using a laptop computer enhanced with a probe and sophisticated software. And portable ultrasound price in 2002 was 30 to 40 thousand dollars, and 2007 price was 15 thousand dollars. Okay, and uh, now you see the typical customers after the portable was introduced. You have the typical customers in China. Okay. Uh, enlarged livers and gallbladder stones. U.S. in emergency rooms to identify, you know, uh, pregnancies, accident sites to check for fluid, all, all these other applications which were not thought of. And the price came down drastically. So if you look at the new global market for this, uh, portable ultrasound global revenues are given. An ultrasound price for 2009 portable was between 15 to 100, and the conventional one is 100 to 350 thousand dollars. Okay, so this was. Uh, Thanks to technology advances, higher priced PC-based models can now perform radiology that required a conventional machine, that once required a conventional machine. Okay, very interesting what they've done. Uh, G did the same thing with electrocardiogram. Okay, ECG. We take ECGs, right? If you have a heart problem, your doctors typically measure ECG to get a, a kind of a, a signature of how your heart is beating. They can tell a lot of things from that. So. Again, the conventional equipment used for that is clunky and, you know, the normal conventional type. I think it costs about fifteen to $30,000 to buy this equipment. And GE realized that, I think this was again for the market in India now, not China. They realized we should have something portable, wherein we have so many cases, we can help them with this. And they came with this very portable, I think, electrocardiogram, which is quite small, uh, size of maybe an old desktop calculator. And this, any idea how much it might be costing? The conventional is about fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. Can you? Obviously, it's less than that. But can you take a guess how much it might be? Any intelligent guesses, or not so intelligent guesses? How much might it cost? Anybody? Any idea? And very close, very close. Uh, not, not, not that low, but it was, it's 800 to 1000 dollars. Okay, quite low. So the, uh, one of the main facilities for doing this, the low cost healthcare uh, devices is based in India. So GE has set up a huge lab in Bangalore. It's called the Jack Welch uh, Research Center. They do a lot of work there on this. Uh, hopefully my, I'm, I'm speaking well, right? Okay, I mean, in the sense you can understand and not a problem in uh, understanding what I tell you. Okay. 
uh, IKEA, right? I've, I've used, I put IKEA here because uh, Swedish furniture maker. How do you think that they're reducing their cost? Right? This you should be knowing because I believe you use IKEA, right? They're very convenient. So how would this be an advanced frugal product? Anybody? Right? Resources, I don't know uh, whether they use less or more, but it's a mature industry, so they can streamline. Their costs are low. Any idea how they are keeping their costs low? How that might be possible? Maybe mass production is one, right? I mean, you're producing for the mass market. What's the other one? They have a very brilliant technique. Yeah? Uh, can very, yeah, it's not that difficult for everyone to build the house. It's just a few, few pieces and then you can build it yourself. Yes, it's, it's, it's disassembled. It's sent to you in a disassembled form, so you have to assemble. That's where they reduce a lot of their cost. Because your packing is very convenient and you can ship more of these. Right? So transportation costs are lower, but you assemble. But it is done in such a nice way that the assembly is not difficult. That's how they cut on the cost. Okay? So... So just look at the different ways in which you can affect frugality in an advanced frugal product. Okay? Remember, the goal is to lower the cost with lesser resources, but I want good functionality. Okay? So different ways of doing it. Uh, sustain, you know, Unilever, we talked about Unilever some time back, and I told you that Unilever was, uh, they have this sustainable culture throughout, not only in their products, but in the way they function. Everywhere. It's written everywhere there. But let me tell you, Unilever was a big hit in India, is a big hit in India, uh, especially to cater to the lower segments, lower income segments. Okay? So they give quality products, quality products, very good, because it's a Unilever brand. Okay? They have a quality associated with it at lower costs. Okay? How do they do that? Any idea? I think this picture might tell you how they are doing it. Any idea? Can somebody... Pardon me? Smaller sachets, right. You have all these smaller sachets available, which you can do. Uh, there is also something else to it, which has gone majorly into making this. How do you think Unilever realized that uh, we need to sell smaller sachets or everything in smaller quantities to make a profit here, right? Larger volumes, but lower cost. How do you think they got that idea? What would be your uh, guess or... Answer. Probably have the right answer. Anybody? How would they have done that? And that is what I'm about to tell you. Also help them with their rival. Okay? Does this ring a bell? Head and shoulders above? Have you heard, heard about head and shoulders shampoo? Right? Who makes them? Procter & Gamble. Okay? They're competitors. Uh, but... Unilever actually, in India, they were more successful than Procter & Gamble initially. Why were they successful? Okay. They were successful because they made smaller packets. But I'm saying, how did they do that? How did they know about it? Yeah? Probably for people that don't have a regular paycheck. So like living uh, between irregular paychecks, they don't have the money to buy large quantities. But how did they know that? How did they know whom to target? That's what I'm asking, right? What would Unilever have done that? So you... Imagine that you're a German company, you want to come to India or, you know, China or, you know. Uh, what do you do to be successful? What's your, how would you go about doing that, right? You have a good product which might, be a, you know, which, which might succeed. Or how do you know in the first place whether you want to launch a new product? The, the first one. Agreed, yes. So it is some kind of research involved, long-term involvement, okay? So Unilever had an R&D in India for a long time. I know when I grew up in India, there was an R&D center very close to our house, you know, which was owned by Hindustan Lever, which was called Hindustan Lever at that time. Now it's known as Unilever. So they did a lot of R&D in India before coming, hitting on this jackpot, okay? R&D is very important for advanced frugal innovations, okay? Because the way you 
make the product and also imp you know implement and then diffuse it into the market. Uh, this is very interesting from Stanford University, okay, and uh, uh, it's called the TB Jugard. Initially, the frugal innovations were also known as Jugard. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. It's an Indian term of making things makeshift. Okay, it doesn't have a very positive connotation. The connotation is not good. When you say Jugard in India, it's like you just put things together and it's not engineering. Okay, that's what grassroots innovations are. What we talked about. So. This is quite advanced. It's an advanced frugal innovation from Stanford. So again, here the, they had to diagnose, you know, this TB disease, right? Which is a very it's a scourge in many countries, and this application arose in Africa. So again, they figured out that there are many, you know, patients who want to be diagnosed of tuberculosis, TB, but same problem as in China for the ultrasound. You have a bigger clunky equipment, and patients have to walk all the way to a clinic where, which will have this TB diagnostic equipment, right? So expenses involved. First of all, in the infrastructure to travel there, and sometimes probably there is no infrastructure, and other times, you know, the equipment is very expensive. So added together too much of expenses involved. So uh, Stanford University came up with this, researchers came up with a nice uh, idea using just a humble smartphone, okay? A smartphone is very powerful. So what they discovered was a fluorescent dye, a new dye, uh, so you take the TB sputum of the patient and you mix the dye with it. And there is a way to figure out if you have TB, if you mix the dye, there are chemical reactions in the sputum and the dye. And if the dye fluoresces, that is scintillates, it gives out lights, okay, it's a special kind of dye. It means the per that person has TB, whoever, you know, from whoever the sputum came from. So they use this idea basically along with a cell phone. So you take the sputum, mix it with the dye, you take a smartphone camera image, okay? And then you send it to the cloud where they have that program. It looks for these scintillations in the sputum and based on that takes a call whether the patient has TB. And the efficacy is much better than the bigger, you know, clunky uh, TB diagnostic machine, okay? Smaller one, better quality, low cost, and, you know, good functionality. Thanks to the humble uh, smartphone. Okay, smartphone technology and fluorescent dyeing for frugal diagnosis of TB. African mobility. Now, uh, what, is, what is the advanced product here or the service here based on the photo I'm showing you? What, what does this advanced frugal innovation deal with? Yeah? Access to cell phone? Yeah, very good. In what way does it help? Very good. Share one cell phone. Okay, yeah, point taken. Point taken. It's to do with cell phones. I do agree. Anything else? Any other reasons other than what he has mentioned? How can cell phones help? Say you are doing a business, you're working. You have your own, I don't know, some kind of a business. Does a cell phone help? Right? In, in what way? Especially if you don't have an infrastructure. Right? Cell phones, and even if you have an infrastructure, a cell phone can help, right? In any scenarios that come to your mind, how they can be helpful? If, yeah, please. Call clients, or customers. Call clients is one way of doing that. How would you figure out if there is a market for a product, right? Supposing you're a fisherman and you have caught a haul of fish, I don't know, whatever, you're in the ocean and you want to figure out if there is a demand for this kind of a thing, you know, somewhere in nearby regions. How would you do it? You call with the cell phone, right? You can make markets with that. So that is how this whole, you know, transactions were done on cell phones. A lot of economic transactions have been done on cell phones. Uh, just to contact your clients and figure out where the business is, talking to your supply chain, all of that. But this also led 
to the creation of a new company that started from Kenya. Anybody knows about the name of this company? In fact, they might be very much responsible for you using your cell phone for this important activity on a day-to-day -day basis. Anybody can take a... What activity am I referring to? Any guess? It's an economic activity on which we are very much dependent. You can't do without it. It helps you to allocate your resources very well, efficiently. I can even borrow Adam Smith's, you know, the invisible hand, right? He talked about the invisible hand in economics, right? But this is, it seems invisible, but it is there in the background. We know it. We keep all our stuff with it. This, you park all your, whatever you earn with it, in it. A, uh, banking, right? Banking, banking is very essential. So internet, uh, mobile phone banking, mo uh, mobile phony, banking in, using mobile phony was mainly born here in Africa, especially Kenya. And this led to the creation of a company called M-Pesa. Very well known, okay? A lot of your mobile phony came from that, which is an advanced social innovation, a service. Low cost because of the cell phone, but very good quality service. This is very interesting. Again, the application is coming from Africa. So uh, if you have to uh, uh, know the weather, right? I told you sometime in the, I think the session before lunch that weather forecasting uses a lot of, you know, uh, good models, computers, hardware and software. Something in the hardware which is very important for weather forecasting. Can you tell me what it is? Not the computers, okay? We are not talking about computers and all that. We are done with that. I'm saying there's something else to this hardware which is very important. Your computers might be talking to them to get all the weather data. Sensors, but where are these sensors? What kind of a sensor? Airplanes. Airplanes, yes, very good. Or what we call Doppler radar, right? And Doppler radar systems are very regularly used for weather forecasting, especially for, you know, uh, forecasting thunderstorms. Again, very expensive. And, you know, we take it for granted when we live in the countries that we do that. We use all these things, but we never know the true cost. Extreme, very expensive, you know, a Doppler radar, which we take for granted. The quality is very good. But... These countries, right, one of the countries actually in Africa was, again, not able to afford this. And they used a very uh, brilliant technique to kind of tackle this. So you mount sensors on, you know, uh, these phone towers or relevant structures, and it monitors the lightning coming from a thunderstorm, right? It just reads the lightning and uses lightning as a proxy or as a measure to figure out, you know, how strong the storm will be and in what direction it will be traveling. Okay, so all these, you know, sensors just capture the light data, lightning data, and they use that, okay, in a mathematical model to figure out what will be the intensity of the storm and, you know, all the other data for the storm along with in what direction it is traveling. And it, it's very interesting how this came about. So they had this application in mind that we, we, we need a cost-effective, you know, product which can help us to forecast storms especially, okay, for this country. And while they were searching for a suitable tool, they came upon this group of scientists at the University of uh, uh, Maryland in College Park. It's a university in the U.S. And there were two of these researchers there who had developed a program which uses lightning data, okay, a model, lightning data to figure out weather. So they borrowed their model and their software and they created this whole infrastructure to make this possible. An advanced frugal innovation, low cost, okay, and very good quality, actually, predictability. It's better than many times even the Doppler radar. And uh, this has been used very effectively. In fact, the US researchers have now started a company to kind of, you know, sell this product. Help from animals, right? So nowadays, I don't know whether you realize this, but sensors have become so uh, kind of, uh, 
progress to such a level, and they also become cost effective. You can actually just trap sensors onto animals or birds. So wherever they go, it's random, but you can measure, you know, a lot of your important parameters, okay? And if you have a large number of these, there's a high likelihood you'll get good data with all of that. In fact, sensors are now, sensors trapped to animals are used for spying. I don't know how many of you know that. There are dolphins and other, you know, aquatic animals which are mounted with sensors by countries to spy on each other. So they just come and, you know, so uh, this is, you should read the news, okay? People make all these things possible. And I don't know how many of you have uh, heard this. They are now making robots out of insects. They're putting, you know, uh, cyber skeletons on cockroaches and you can actually control them, okay, to do your bidding. And uh, dead spiders are being put to use. A spider which is dead, you can retrofit that with a, you know, with the right gadgetry and make the spider lift things. Apparently, it has got a proper grip to lift things and, you know, for certain objects, which you can't, it's cost effective to do it this way. So they, it's called necro, necrobotics, okay? Using dead insects as robots. So yeah, this, this using animals is becoming a very uh, uh, kind of a new area in robotics and engineering. India space scientists, okay? We were, we were kind of cash trapped when a space program started in India and uh, it is, a testament to the brilliance of our scientists. Okay, so we have one of the best space programs in the world today, ISRO. Okay, they are doing a lot of stuff. Now, of course, ISRO is not what it was when it started. It was cash-trapped at that point in time. And here you see the ISRO scientists taking the nose of a rocket, a sounding rocket, I believe, okay, on a cycle. And the entire ISRO facility was based in a church. Okay, that's how it started, very humble beginning. It has become, you know, very competent today. And... Uh, they have, we recently sent a probe to Mars called Mangalyan and the cost was low enough that it takes more money to make one of the cricket leagues in India, okay? So 74 million, which is less than setting up a team in the Indian Premier League for cricket, okay? And this worked very well, the Mangalyan. Again, you know, a, a very good example of an advanced physical product, low cost and, you know, good quality functionality. Uh, have you heard about a square kilometer array? Anybody? Square kilometer array? Does the name ring a bell? No? Again, astronomy. And here I think uh, it's, a, it's an array of radio telescopes for radio astronomy. So instead of one, you have an array of telescopes which are used to uh, gather astronomic data, right? For many applications. So... Africa, again, wanted to get, you know, house a, a square kilometer array. The cost was a problem. And the way they worked on this was to use existing dishes that were used by, uh, you know, mobile phone and TV operators. The dishes that they had left behind were taken, retrofitted, and made into a radio telescope. Okay? Very, very interesting. They actually salvaged. They actually salvaged these dishes and made them into radio telescopes, okay? So by doing that, cut the cost immensely. Again, you know, a case of cheap but very good astronomy called the SALT, okay, S-A-L-T. I forget the full abbreviation for this. Uh, it, it, it's a very interesting piece of uh, hardware. Uh, in fact, if you come to my website, frugalengineering.in, I've actually put a photograph of this, okay, image. It's, it's, it's a very good representation of an advanced frugal innovation, how you can engineer something from scratch so that it, it functions well affordably, okay, to just tell you what they have done. So here is the, the, the schematic. Uh, first of all, they figured out that if we, first of all, they figured out that if we have to use, uh, want to get into astronomy, which area of astronomy do we get into? There is an optical way of looking at stars, like you can also look at the radio signals, you can look at the X-rays emanated, right? Gamma rays. There are different ways of doing, you know, astronomy based on the spectrum, part of the spectrum in which you're looking at. So for Africa, right, they thought that the radio part will help them a lot for, with many of their applications. So now to cut the cost, they got into radio astronomy. And number two, for radio astronomy, you can, 
uh, where do you think a telescope typically has to be located? A telescope, right? If I have to put an optical telescope, say light, is height a critical factor where it's located? Why? Atmosphere. atmosphere okay. What from the atmosphere? Wobble. wobble. Anything else? Very good. No, wobble is one thing. Anything else? Other than wobble. Something like pollution. Pollution of what? Light pollution, exactly, right? So for telescopes, they have to be at the right height, okay? So that you don't have pollution from the, you know, or any disturbance from the atmosphere and the pollution. Maybe light pollution coming from man-made activities. So for a radio telescope, it turns out, the height is, you can, you can, you can be at a, a height which is not very expensive to make. Because as the height increases, there are costs, you know, involved in it to put a right telescope, you know? In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there is a, astronomical telescope located close to Mount Everest, okay, on one of those heights, very close to it. So this one was a radio telescope, so at a decent height, which is not very high, so your cost is reduced. Number two, your, telescopes, your telescope needs to have movement, right, to look at the patch of sky where you're looking at. So this one had limited movement. They wanted to look at one patch of sky, so in engineering, do you know about degrees of freedom, right? So it had limited degrees of freedom. In fact, only one. It, it, it was rotating about the vertical axis. That's it. Okay? So by doing that, you're reducing your cost further. Okay? Now, looking at it, what else do you think they have done to reduce the cost? So we talked about reduced degrees of freedom, radio telescopy, so reduced height, something else that you see there. As an engineer, you might find that very intriguing. something that catches your attention. You don't even have to read it, maybe just a glimpse. Which is that part that you, I have not talked about it. It's, it's, it's staring at you right there, looking at you. Yeah? If it is not the degrees of freedom, we have talked about that. We have talked about the height. So what else do you see which is different there? Okay, I'll give you one more hint. In Germany, I see a lot of bees. When I go to eat food, right, I see these bees coming to me. Right? So there is something here which is related to a bee. It's a very, sorry, you know, uh, a very vague hint, but a big one. Pardon me? The glass. the glass or the mirror? What about it? What about it? Yeah, very good. It's, it's, it's to do with the mirror, like you mentioned, right? Right here. Uh, I said B because of the hexagonal structure, right? So how are, you know, uh, telescopic mirrors, any idea what is the shape of a telescopic mirror for astronomy? You usually use, you know, this curve. Any idea? What's that called? Uh, parabola, right? So, but this one is spherical. It's a hemisphere, okay? So, something like this. It's a hemisphere. So, two things here. If you have a spherical mirror, you have something called a spherical aberration, right? A spherical aberration is an error. Your image will not be correctly formed because there are problems with the focus, because it is spherical. It's, it's not a flaw in your engineering. It is just a spherical geometry. So, they've attached a software to that, so it takes a spherical image, corrects it for the right signal. And that is not expensive, okay? That lowers the expense, in fact. The other brilliant thing is, the mirror is not polished in one go, okay? You have to polish these mirrors a lot to get that nice finish, okay? To get the right focus. So here, they're using these hexagonal units, and each hexagonal unit is made in some part of the world. Okay? And it was all shipped to that location in Africa and, and assembled there. So by doing that, they reduced their cost much further. So brilliant, you know, you, limited movement, 
okay? And a spherical mirror with spherical aberration and making the mirror out of hexagonal units. So you, you put all this together, it is a fraction of the Keck telescope, I think, in Europe. Okay, so they've done a brilliant job, and this is all engineered from scratch. This is a very good example of an advanced frugal innovation. By the way, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, uh, polishing a mirror is, is, is kind of very, uh, it's, it's, it's highest form of manufacturing. It's not that easy to do it. Uh, you heard about a Hubble Space Telescope? You know, when Hubble Space Telescope was first made, and when they got the first image, okay, I think it was the vice president of the US or somebody who inaugurated the event, they saw a fuzzy image, okay? And then they were doing everything possible to figure out if what they had done was correct or wrong. And they said, no, all the, the, the procedure we are following is correct. It turned out that one of the lenses, the main lens of the Hubble, the tolerance was not met while grinding it by a millionth of an inch. Okay, they had missed it in the manufacturing. So now you have put the Hubble out there. How do you go and correct it, right? It's not like the movie Armageddon, right? You go there and uh, start doing everything possible to correct it. You can't do that. So they later devised software to take the faulty image and get the right image out of it. It's a brilliant piece of engineering what they achieved in the end. Okay, so these things are very sensitive, you know, how you make them. So built on a shoestring, the salt, 30 million budget, okay? Built at a height of 1800 meters, not the best location for crisp images, but compensate with accurate spectroscopy. Complement southern hemisphere observatories who cannot watch after event below horizon. All nicely designed from scratch to reduce the cost, but give maximum functionality, good functionality. Spherical mirror, I told you, plus aberration character instead of paraboloid mirror. Uh, and built from 91 smaller hexagonal segments. As with any frugal product, when you, uh, when you develop a frugal product, many times you might have problems with the functionality when you start using it. The brilliance lies in how well you design it from scratch. Okay? But for products like uh, a telescope, you can't foresee all the problems that can arise. So they had some problems initially, but everything has been nicely ironed out and taken care of. Cube satellites. Uh, have you heard about cube satellites? Now, a lot of schools are getting into these projects. Okay, I'm sure LUH is also involved in it. So these are satellites the size of a shoebox. Okay, and you can have them with all the important uh, sensors you want. And you can just, you know, send a swarm of cube satellites, so many of them, to do your job. You don't have to send one big satellite, but a swarm, a group, or many of these cube satellites to... Uh, you know, monitor important parameters for weather, remote sensing, and all of that. And this is, again, the cost is reduced compared to sending big and bulky satellites. Any other advantage of using a cube satellite, which reduces your cost a lot compared to conventional satellites? Yeah, I have a smaller cube, so manufacturing is easier, costs are reduced, lesser materials, I do agree with that. Right, simple sensors, not a problem. What else? Something else also gets reduced. Yes, very good. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Yeah, you don't need bigger rockets. You need just smaller rockets to launch these things up there. Okay, so uh, you get a, a big bang for you know whatever buck you put in. So as shown here, right? You can see this that. The cost is reduced due to smaller rockets, okay? Small rockets will cut costs and raise demand for small satellites. And uh, more nano satellites were launched in 2017 than 10 kg plus satellites and other spacecraft combined. Okay, very interesting. Uh, IIT Metras, there are a couple of programs where students have launched, you know, boxed uh, these cube satellites. Uh, made at IIT Metras and then launched on one of the ISRO rockets. So I'm, I'm sure LUH and Germany are also involved in these kinds of applications. So again, you can see the, you know, the, the comparison here. You're going from Dove, uh, Planet Labs, number of satellites 32, weight is 5 kg, optical and near-infrared spectral bands, okay, for instruments and spatial resolution is given. And then you see for comparison, SkySat, Landsat, and Worldview, right? You're just looking at the size of these satellites, you know that 
a lot of resources have been saved in going with the cube satellite. Okay? The design is simple. Your resources have been saved and proportionately the costs have also gone down. Okay? But underlying all this, whatever we have covered till now, you, you have very good engineering and science making this possible. It all looks very easy now to look at. Oh, it is so nice, you know, cube satellite, what's so big about it and all that. But it took a lot of thinking to get to this point. A okay. lot of progress in technology in different areas and also progress in the field itself and progress in thinking before we could get to the point where a cube will suffice and you don't want to have some of these huge satellites do the job for you. Please keep track of these things because this is a general trend I'm seeing in many products in many sectors. Okay? It is happening everywhere. Frugal is definitely not cheap. This is, I think, a uh, uh, way the satellites are made, cube satellites. I believe this was snapshot taken. Again, uh, cheaper cube sets, okay, how they are launched. Cheaper plasma, this is very interesting. Uh, researchers at uh, California Berkeley, right, Professor Graves, his group has developed a technology for developing plasma with an inexpensive equipment. Plasma has got a lot of uh, applications. So these are relatively very high-end, you know, applications. And even here, there is an urge to reduce cost and develop new technologies which will give good functionality but at a lower cost. And this was based partly on, you know, my work was uh, kind of referenced in it. I've been one of the early researchers in this frugal area. So the idea was kind of, uh, they liked the idea of, you know, developing something at a low cost but giving good functionality. And the plasma qualifies for that. Low cost, uh, you know, individuals in a precision swarm. A researcher at MIT, so they've developed many of these uh, little robots, simple robots, which can act in a swarm, right? Act in a group and get your functionality done, okay? Which is very interesting, okay? Again, there is a lot of complexity involved in how you maneuver the robots, how you design them. They appear simple, but the swarm action can get complicated and the control can get complicated, but Again, it's an advanced frugal product because the design is simple, okay? Your quality is good, functionality is good, cost is low. This is, uh, any idea what this is used for? What is this? Particle accelerator. Any idea what particle accelerators are used? We are going in, I told you, right, we are going in increasing degrees of sophistication to look at these advanced frugal innovations. Yeah, please. Pardon me? Big Bang, yes, that is one of the applications. Yeah, very good, very good. So basically particle accelerators, you have beams of charged particles which are accelerated to very high speeds and then they are smashed into each other and the particles coming out of that smashing process gives you a uh, lot of signals and hints about a lot of other things in particle physics, okay? Even, you know, the secrets of the universe and a lot of other things. So these are, this is a very basic setup. Uh, its applications might not be uh, directly applicable, but the understanding that it gives us, a lot of other things are based on it. Uh, now, making particle accelerators are very expensive, it, and it's also a long drawn out process. You have one in CERN, right, in, in Switzerland. The CERN in Switzerland, so, uh, anybody has read any idea as to how big the ring is wherein you kind of magnetically accelerate these uh, uh, high energy beams to very high speeds. It takes a certain distance to accelerate them, okay? And any idea how much that distance is? Or a ring is, you have a ring, you keep on accelerating in the ring, you keep on going, you know, but the ring itself, any, you know, just a rough, uh, Estimate. 26 yeah, 26 to 27 kilometers. Yeah, very good, very good. And I think now they are planning one for 100 kilometers, right? So if I have to just, you know, uh, common sense, a 27 kilometer infrastructure with the tubes and all that, uh, you are having high energy beams, so you can't skimp on the material. It has to be high quality material to get you the right results, accurate results, and now you have the distance of 27 kilometers. So you, you take all that into account. It's, it's a mega project involving a lot of euros and dollars. Very expensive, okay, for what it does. So 
there is another program, parallel program at the CERN called AWAKE, A-W-A-K-E, okay? You can check their, uh, you can check their website. Okay, AWAKE, and what it does, it uses plasma technology to do, you know, uh, particle physics, the same thing that sort of CERN does, but instead of 27 kilometers, they have reduced that to 21 centimeters. Okay? 27 kilometers to say 27 centimeters. So it's a tabletop accelerator. And it gives better results for some experiments compared to what the sun does. Here it is. Plasma afterburner, just 30 centimeters long, accelerates electrons 100 times faster than existing ones. Okay? So here it's like your, your cost is reduced drastically. Results are very good. Results are very good. Okay? Again, an application of an advanced frugal innovation in a very high area, in a very high-tech area. Uh, there are also now, you know, many cheaper tabletop x-rays coming up, again, you know, for uh, doing x-ray studies, but on a tabletop, okay, instead of having the big clunky equipment. Any questions till now? Anybody, any doubts or... maybe the food at Mensa. Mensa food is, you know, always also. We need a break. Uh, this is interesting, okay? Stinky. So this was a... Uh, <laughs> it was called Stinky. Uh, I'm glad the class laughed. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting term, I agree. You know, first time when I read it, I was also amused. Uh, a competition set up by MIT for an underwater robot. You know, these universities set these... Uh, uh, competitions, right? For the electric vehicle, I think there was something back in 2000, early 2000, uh, set up by Stanford for, I think, uh, Prize X or something, wherein you had to have an autonomous SUV go from a certain point to a certain point, right? To navigate itself. And that started the whole thing of autonomous vehicles. It kick-started the whole thing. So this was for uh, underwater robotics at MIT. And there are four of these people who are kind of engineers and some of them not engineers and they got together, they were not researchers, but they got together and built a submarine that won the competition. And in this competition, there were people from other US universities and universities in the world who had their own dedicated robotics researchers making nice underwater robotic drones to win this competition. And what you see there, Stinky, right, got won the deal. So it is actually duct taped. They took all the components off the shelf and duct taped it together and made this thing possible, okay? But even doing this, right, you need to have a fairly good grasp of how this thing works, uh, the environment, and a lot of other details of the project to win this thing, although it was done at a very low cost, okay? Also a very good example of an advanced uh, frugal innovation. I think this is the last slide of uh, improvised robot summary for AFIs. Okay, so this is called Spare Parts, Four Undocumented Teenagers, One Ugly Robot, and The Battle for the American Dream. It was a book that came in 2014, very interesting story. I think that's the last slide, and maybe we can have a break now, is it okay? And we start the ne next session, last session, on frugal engineering, how to bring engineering into this.